ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are going, please continue eating, enjoy your dessert, and I think there's gonna be coffee. Uh, but in uh, the interest of time dictates that we start now. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, I'm Keith Richberg. I'm on, uh, on the board here, and I'm, uh, I'm honored to be now at, at Hong Kong University, where a colleague is our speaker today, who I'll introduce in just a moment. Um, but I will ask you all to please turn off your cell phones. We don't want any ringing during the uh, conversation, or you may be taken out back. Uh, and uh, with, I, I want to warn you that this, li this event is being live streamed, so if you don't want your face to be known in the country that you plan to go back and try to conquer, uh, please do... Uh, you know, hide your face somehow. Uh, I've noticed on the live stream now on our Facebook and Instagram, we've suddenly got a lot of new followers from Africa and Central America and South America. I think that's, I'm not 100% sure why it might be the topic. Um, I will say, uh, by the way, this is our last, uh, our last major luncheon event of the year because we're going to let you all take a holiday break. We have a lot of great events coming up uh, in January, so please stay tuned. And we do have uh, space for our New Year's Eve party and a lot of other Christmas events, so please check the FCCHK.org uh, 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 website to find out all the events that are going on here over the holidays. But this will, this will be our last major speaker, and I have to say, you know, if you look at some of the events we had, uh, just a week ago, standing here, we had Derek Mitchell, who was talking about, he's from the National uh, Democratic Institute, talking about the importance of democracy in the world. So we thought it would be a really good idea to bookend that. Um, now, D uh, Derek Mitchell from National Democratic Institute did not get as many people here as how to be a dictator. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that means that many of our members here have some other ideas of what they plan to do with this information going on. Uh, you know, as a young man, I actually grew up in the age of some of the more flamboyant dictators of the world stage, Idi Amin, uh, Gaddafi, Mobutu in Zaire, uh, uh, you, know, um, you know, you go down to Haiti, Baby Doc Duvalier, I mean, they're all on the world stage when I was a young man, so before I decided to become a journalist, I thought I might take over a small country, uh, but I didn't know how, and the reason is because we hadn't seen this book. <laughs> And so therefore, I was really excited when I got to meet Frank over here. Uh, Frank Decoder is, you won't be able to tell by his accent, but he is originally from the Netherlands. I'm not sure you still speak Dutch. Um, he's chair professor of humanities at the University of Hong Kong, where I teach. And he's written more than a dozen books, many of which you might from, be familiar with. Uh, uh, the People's Trilogy was an amazing uh, collection, if you're not familiar with it. And Mao's Great Famine won an, uh, so many awards that I can't name them here. So without further ado, please get your pens and paper ready if you want the how-to lesson. Frank Decoder, author of How to Be a Dictator. Oh, thank you very much. I'm uh, delighted to be here. I'm a little concerned. A man came in earlier on and asked me, um, can my wife attend this? Uh, she wants to be a director. Oh, I, I said, no, no, it's, it's how to be a, a dictator, not a director. <laughs> so he said, oh, no, she's a dictator already. <laughs> and so, so you walked out. <laughs> uh, I'm delighted to be here. Um, first and foremost, how to be a dictator is really a narrative history. There's, there's no abstraction, no general theory, no generalizing there. It's really about unique individuals in unique circumstances. Um, so there's a lot of storytelling going on. I would say eight suitably chilling tales in, in that book. Um, at the risk of disappointing some of you, um, it's not a guide on how to be a dictator. Uh, in, in fact, if there were such a book, uh, it'd be very difficult to write. Um, it, it's not a ladybird book. There are no eight steps to become dictator. There are no 12 rules on how to, to conquer power and, and keep it. Um, in fact, if anything comes out of the book, is that these unique individuals in unique circumstances, uh, they go from um, Mussolini to Hitler, Stalin, Mao, four big ones, Kim Il-sung, also big, I imagine, Duvalier, or Papa Doc in Haiti, 
to Ceausescu in Romania and finally Mengistu in Ethiopia. They're all quite unique individuals. Not only that, but they've got great talents. So ability matters a great deal and luck. And it's that combination which is so important. In particular, the ability to use both fortune and misfortune, which is why it cannot possibly be a guide on how to be a dictator. Nonetheless, overall, there are two main instruments that appear to me to be very important out of these eight tales. Uh, one is terror, and seemingly contradictory, uh, there is worship, or what I call the cult personality. Uh, fear and love. We know a great deal about the terror. Uh, we know a great, great deal about the prisons, the camps, the, the knock on the door in the middle of the night, the uh, extraordinary crimes against humanity, but we know less about the cult of personality, which is the subtitle of the book and turns out, I think, to be quite important. Uh, we know little about it, despite the fact that hundreds of millions of people uh, throughout the 20th century, cheered their own dictators even as they were herded down the road towards serfdom. The portrait of a dictator in many parts of the country was everywhere to be seen, uh, displayed in every factory, every school, every office. People had to bow to his likeness, pass by his statue, praise his name, extol his genius. I think at the heart of that cult of personality, there is a paradox uh, which is specific to every dictator. The paradox of the modern dictator is that he must create the illusion of popular support uh, since the French Revolution, 1789. But in particular, in the 20th century, people are supposed to be sovereign and select their leader through an election. The 20th century is the age of democracy. But dictators, of course, opted to seize power, either by organizing a coup or by rigging the system. And as they found out, when you obtain power through violence, you must maintain it with even more violence. But violence can be a very blunt instruments. You do need terror. You do need the police, spies, interrogators. But ultimately, if you can coerce your population to acclaim you in public, if you can create the illusion of popular support, you will last a lot longer. In other words, it is good to police every street. It is probably better if you can police every mind. Your goal really ought to be that people wake up in the middle of the night afraid of their own thoughts. That's the goal, I think. So fear must be instilled in the population at large, but also the inner court, the entourage of the dictator. After all, a dictator is someone who seizes power and by seizing power, he raises the prospect of someone else doing precisely the same thing, the stab in the back. Dictators are surrounded by allies and rivals, all waiting in the wings. There are many ways in which dictators deal, of course, with rivals. There's endless purges, endless purges. There's manipulation, there's divide and rule. But ultimately, again, the cult of personality works rather well. It uh, forces allies and rivals uh, to collaborate in common subordination. Most of all, it compels them to stand up and acclaim the dictator in front of all the others. It turns everyone into a liar. When everybody lies, it becomes very difficult to find out who thinks what. And when you don't know who thinks what, it becomes difficult to find associates accomplices when you wish to overthrow the man and seize power in turn. Who organized the cult? Well, there were, of course, writers, poets, playwrights, powerful ministries of propaganda, 
sometimes entire sections of industry devoted to churning out cult objects. But ultimately, the responsibility was always with the dictator himself. Mussolini, by one account, spent half of his time projecting himself as the all-powerful leader of Italy. He would spend time in Villa Torlonia, a sprawling estate he acquired in 1925, sitting in his projection room, studying his every gesture during his public performances. Uh, everything was calculated to project an image of vitality and power. He also showed himself to millions in whirlwind tours of the country, uh, endless mass meetings with workers, inauguration of public projects. Hitler also devoted an extraordinary amount of time to building up his own image. He was a, a gifted orator, a talented self-publicist, a choreographer who worked tirelessly at building up his own party. He hired a photographer, again, to produce images that projected strength and sheer willpower. 1933, as he discovered the radio, he worked hard to make sure his voice could be heard everywhere. When Joseph Goebbels failed to make enough of cinema, Hitler turned around, approached Leni Riefenstahl, who made sure he was the star in a great number of movies shown in every theater. Nonetheless, frequently, the expressions of devotion from ordinary people seemed to be so spontaneous that outsiders, and later on historians, thought that they were actually genuine. Millions of people, we have been told, adored Adolf Hitler, adored Stalin, adored Mao. But how would we know? The very first casualty in any dictatorship is always freedom of expression. W within a year after the Nazis came to power in 1933, 100,000 ordinary Germans were locked up in concentration camps. The Gestapo, the brown shirts, the courts did not hesitate to lock up anyone who expressed an opinion that was critical of the regime by 1938. It was enough for a person to express a negative opinion of the Führer to be locked up in a prison. Of course, you could say that on his birthday, on the 20th of April, 1939, the Führer reigned like an emperor sitting on a raised dais on the Via Triumphalis built by Albert Speer to review that mighty war machine he had been building up for years as he was acclaimed literally by tens of thousands of assembled Germans. But who knows that exactly a year later, in 1940, there were a mere 75 well-wishers gathered outside the chancellery on Adolf Hitler's birthday. Well, Adolf Hitler fancied himself as Europe's finest actor. Mussolini, too, thought he was a great performer. We tend to forget that ordinary people in dictatorships also must learn how to act. They must cheer on command. They must parrot the party line. They must recite the work of the leader. And those who fail to play along or find, interrogated, locked up, occasionally shot. In other words, ordinary people here are coerced to produce the illusion of popular support. They are condemned to perpetual enthusiasm. I'm not trying to say that nobody loved their own dictator. Uh, but the whole point of the cult of personality was not to convince or persuade anyone. The cult of personality was there to destroy common sense, to enforce obedience, to isolate individuals and crush their dignity. Now, here's my point three. I will have four in total. 
Sometimes the coat, even in Marxist Leninist regimes, appeared to be tinted with superstition and magic. It had traditional undertones, as if it somehow welled from the hearts of the people. This, too, was deliberately fabricated from above. In the case of Adolf Hitler, it was crystal clear. He saw himself as a messiah in an almost a religious bond with his people. Mussolini encouraged feelings of devotion, uh, which were characteristic of the Christian church, with holy pictures, holy sites, pilgrimages, the hope of a holy healing touch from the leader in Rome. Duvalier, in Haiti, encouraged rumors about his otherworldly powers. He very much projected him as someone who uh, was in touch with the other world, like a voodoo priest. He modeled himself on Baron Samedi, the spirit of the dead, guardian of cemeteries, by appearing occasionally in public with a a tall hat and tail coat. He would mumble behind dark glasses in a deep nasal tone, as if somehow casting incantations on his enemies. In the case of Mengistu, he rapidly, after the revolution in 1974, occupied the Grand Palace, had Haile Selassie, the emperor, throttled to death, buried him underneath his very own office, placed his desk right above it in order to somehow uh, I guess, uh, profit from that charisma coming from the body of his predecessor. He was a self-proclaimed Marxist who reigned like an emperor. In the case, of course, of Marxist-Leninist regimes, there was a reason why uh, these religious overtones were quite deliberately cultivated. And the reason is quite simple, really. In overwhelmingly rural countries, like Russia, China, Korea, Ethiopia. The very vast majority of the population had very little interest in the tenets of Marxism, Leninism. They, like me, failed to understand uh, the appeal of dialectical materialism. Stalin understood this perfectly well, and others in his wake when the Soviets decided to embalm their leader, Lenin, and display him on Red Square, they very much hoped that the population would worship him very much like a holy figure. My final point, point four, in case you lost track, is that loyalty to a person matters more than loyalty to a creed. When I went to university, oh, it was all about the importance of ideology. While ideologies can be very decisive, the greatest enemies of the Bolsheviks were the Mensheviks. Uh, ultimately, what a dictator wants is absolute loyalty. It would have been dangerous to study Marx during the Cultural Revolution. One was a Stalinist under Stalin, a Maoist under Mao, a chemist under Kim. Not only that, but frequently these self-proclaimed Marxist-Leninists turn Marx on their head. It was supposed to be an international proletarian reform. Marx applauded the workers, despised the peasants. Mao turned that ideology on its head by making the very despised peasants the spearhead of the revolution. Camille Song went even further. Material conditions were all important in Marxism, but he decided that spiritual self-reliance would be a great guide. By 1968, all foreign books became suspect in North Korea, including the works of Marx and Engels. By 1972, Marxism-Leninism was written out of the Constitution, replaced by the thought of Kim Il-sung. So here you have a Marxist regime that doesn't acknowledge Marx. Again, loyalty to a person rather than loyalty to a creed. Um, in conclusion, of course, dictators will lie too. 
by their entourage. They were surrounded by sycophants, and they lied to their own people. But they also lied to themselves. Some of them veered off into a world of their own and came to genuinely believe in their great genius. Ceausescu was one wonderful example. Others became unmoored from reality altogether, one example being Adolf Hitler. They teetered between paranoia on the one hand and hubris on the other. They saw enemies everywhere, inside the country and abroad. As a consequence, made all major decisions on their own with huge consequences for literally tens of millions of people. Uh, the pact Stalin signed, signed with Hitler would be one example. Hitler's invasion of the Soviet Union would be another. The Great Leap Forward is also a good example of a decision made by one dictator with devastating consequences for vast parts of the population. But ultimately, since so much hinged on the decisions they took, and since they were surrounded by liars and sycophants, um, one faux pas could be enough to have them fall from power. Again, Ceausescu is a wonderful example. You can see the moment he falters in his speech uh, just before Christmas 1989. You can see the fear being dispelled as the TV screens go blank and the people literally rebel. Uh, so it doesn't take much occasionally for a dictator to fall, even if that moment may be decades uh, in the coming. I will stop here. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much. That was really, really interesting. I'm, I'm going to be a slight dictator here as moderator and ask the first question. <laughs> uh, based on your talk. Uh, one of the things about our modern day authoritarian leaders, um, and some would say dictators, for example, Putin in Russia, Erdogan in Turkey, Hun Sen in Cambodia, uh, what, they seem to have to have a need to have an election to legitimize their rule. Um, when did that become a feature of dictatorship to have to have the need for elections to have legitimacy? Yeah. Um, it's a that's a very good question. Um, I, what is a dictator? It's an interesting question. I should probably have written a book called How to Spot a Dictator. <laughs> there seems to be a great amount of confusion. I slurp my noodles at home. My wife won't allow me to do it. She's a dictator. My boss is a dictator. The leader of my democratically elected country is a dictator. Everyone I don't like is a dictator, so the term has acquired all sorts of uh, new dimensions. Um, but ultimately, it's about power, and you can do two things with it. You can see that throughout the 20th century. You can either separate it. With separation of powers, you build up checks and balances, an independent judicial system, etc., etc. A great historical achievement, and it's very difficult to do. I mean, how do you get a leader to respect the court order? Not easy. Um, on the other hand, throughout the 20th century, of those who wish to concentrate power, they spurn all that wishy-washy separation of powers. Um, so these are two radically um, opposed um, users of power, and hence two radically opposed regimes. Uh, now, it's true that since the late 1980s, uh, we've seen developments in which a leader operates within a system of separation of powers, um, but undermines it. Um, I haven't written about this in the book, but I, I call this um, de-democratization. Uh, in other words, to come back to the two examples you gave me, Putin, I think Erdogan as well, is that right? In the case of Putin, um, he is no Stalin. He is not a new dictator. I'm sorry to say this if you hate this man. Um, but ultimately, uh, it says so very clearly in the Constitution, it's a federated, uh, democratic, federated republic. You, you cannot undermine uh, the judicial independence if you don't have it. You cannot harass and hound your opponents if you don't have any. 
you, you cannot try to uh, constrict the opposition party if there is no opposition party. No Stalin, no dictator would ever have contemplated having an opposition party or independent judicial uh, systems. The same, of course, of, is true for Erdogan. My understanding is that one of the opposition leaders was elected mayor of the capital of their country. Just imagine here in Hong Kong having an opposition leader to be mayor of Beijing or Pyongyang. It's unimaginable. So that, to me, is the difference there is between dictatorships on the one hand and uh, countries in which you see de-democratization. You call, call them autocrats if you want to call them something. I want to get to as many questions as possible here. So uh, remember, we're live streaming this. So if you are planning on taking over a small country, you might want to ask that separately after we're not on Facebook. Yes, right here. <laughs> Please identify yourself. Good afternoon, uh, Tom Holland of, of various occasional affiliations. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Professor de Cotta, for that really quite chilling uh, insight into um, the way dictators operate. I, I'm just wondering how, you said, you said dictators won't brook opposition, but how essential to a dictator or a dictatorship is it to have enemies? to have someone to point the finger at, to, to condemn, to, to hate? It's intrinsic. The, the, it's, it's, it seems like a very straightforward question. The answer is uh, it's intrinsic to, to dictatorship, that there's an outside enemy there. But ultimately, the problem with a dictator is that there's always the fear um, of your power being taken away from you which means that you spend an awful lot of time keeping tabs on the people around you. You observe them. You try to find out what they really think because you don't know what they think. You yourself have made sure that they've become sycophants who will tell you everything you want to hear. So that was the problem with Stalin. You thought these people are not sincere. It was dangerous under Stalin to be overly enthusiastic and overly sincere because that was a sign of insincerity. <laughs> so how do you find out who your true enemies are? Which is where they become increasingly paranoid and see them everywhere. Stalin purged until the very, very end. Uh, Mao, in the case of the Cultural Revolution, was so afraid that he literally managed to pit people against people for, for a good three, four, five years, then had the army move in, and then, of course, purged the army. Only at the very end of his life did the cult of personality disappear because he felt more or less, at long last, at ease, having destroyed the lives of tens of millions of people. But I think what you are alluding to is another issue, namely the black hand issue. Is there a foreign power behind it? The very existence of democracy elsewhere is a threat to a dictator. Uh, regardless of how big that country is, if there's something elsewhere where people can speak freely and publish freely, that in itself is a threat. And ultimately, that must be crushed. So it's not just that there are enemies elsewhere who constantly organize, instigate rebellion, it's that it must be crushed. The very interesting speech by Deng Xiaoping, which he gives just weeks after the tanks depart from Beijing in 1989, which has been translated and published, uh, except that if you find the original speech, uh, there is a bit that has been deleted in which he accuses foreign powers of being the black hand behind it. It's a constant. Paul Zimmer. Uh, thank you, yeah, Paul Zimmerman. Uh, may I invite you to uh kind of uh, rate the performance of some today's leaders, uh, our own leader in Beijing, uh, uh, against the four traits. And, and, but if you want to avoid that, you may take Trump, I mean, just to have a cop out. And please leave out the president of the FCC. <laughs> you, you named two people, one leader in Washington and one leader in Beijing. But as I said, if you wish to find out what a true dictatorship is, you must fly to that country and try to find somebody who's openly critical of their own leader. 
I think chances are if you fly to the United States, it'd be very difficult to find somebody who's actually something good to say about their leader. <laughs> Chances are Beijing be the other way around. Let me put it this way. If members of the NBA in the United States are quite happy to criticize the man who was elected, but will kneel down and grovel because they fear that they might have offended the leader in Beijing, you should know where your dictator is. You asked me to rape the one in Beijing. Um, I would advise him to read my book. <laughs> and in particular, <laughs> read the last bit where I point out that it's very dangerous to lie to yourself and surround yourself by sycophants because one full power and the whole thing might crumble. Uh, Steve Vines. Um, Frank. I, I have to ask you about China, I'm sorry, yet again, but just do know a little about the subject. Do, do you think that the Chinese dictatorship has actually discovered a formula that other dictatorships haven't, in as much as they, the dictators change and the system survives, and the system, in fact, actually, in current days, seems to revert to precisely the most um, strong-arm version of the one that existed during the Mao era? Um, the, the problem with concentration of power is that the, the playbook is very limited. What you can do as a dictator is very limited, which, which is why um, roughly eight chapters is enough. I could have written 20 or 30. There's great variety there, but ultimately, um, you know, the playbook is limited. You, you go out and you crack skulls. That's what you do. You can do it in an elegant way, indirectly, or you can just, just go out there and crack them. Um, with separation of powers, um, these systems become ever more complex and complicated with civil society, with legislation, with all sorts of, of rules about how the power is separated and how a court order is made with legal advisors. It thrives and becomes complicated, but it also becomes more complicated because it's constantly adjusting to changing circumstances. Um, but in the dictatorship, um, ultimately, since you wish to concentrate power in the hands of one individual, one person, there tends to be a very uniform answer. Uh, it's uniformity that matters, not diversity. And, and ultimately, I think that's not exactly a very good solution to long-term problems imposing one culture, one time zone, one language, one this, one that. Uh, it's very difficult to do. It's very time consuming. Also, since you want to talk about the PRC, uh, remember, all those regimes were just amazing. Wow, you know, trains run on time in Italy. <laughs> the streets are clean. Italy is a transformed country. There's, there's no end to visitors in the mid-1930s who applaud fascism. There are Americans coming back from Siberia in the 1960s and 70s. I think, oh, the Russians have found a new economic system that works much better than ours. Why do we even bother fighting this Cold War? We will lose. Let's just throw in the hat. And on and on it goes. These regimes have devote extraordinary resources to projecting stability and strength. But you don't know what's going on behind it. Until later. Yeah. Uh, one My name is Ching Chen, a retired journalist. Uh, two questions. Uh, an ideological one. Uh, uh, of the major dictators that we experienced in the 20th century, they seem to have a common ideological root, which is Marxism. Even the Germans fought against uh, Russia, the, the Germans called themselves National Socialism. So is Marxism the, ideo the common ideological root to all these uh, dictators? The second question is that... Um, is what? Is Marxism. Marxism. The, common root. the second, my, my second question is, uh, I read the book by Timothy Sinder, who advice on 20 lessons from tyranny. He spoke on tyranny. 
So, uh, could you also advise us on similar uh, uh, points to prevent a dictatorship from forming? Timothy Snyder, the one who thinks he's found, found tyranny in the United States, but is unable to find Beijing on a map? <laughs> Allow me not to comment any further. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. um, the common ideology, I don't think there is one. The whole point about these dictators is that they are able to just move from one tenet to another. In fact, the only one who is honest in there is Mussolini, who spurns ideology and openly says, we do not wish to be hemmed in by any set of ideas. We follow our intuition. And ultimately, that's what dictators do. They will not hesitate to follow a completely different course. And you see this also with communist dictators. I think the very abandonment of Marxism-Leninism in North Korea uh, is a good example. Uh, you might say nationalism, anti-Semitism, is a powerful ideology in the case of Nazi Germany. But my answer would be, well, yeah, nationalism, anti-Semitism apparently still widespread to this very day. So surely that's not it, really. It's always about power. And much more about loyalty rather than a set of ideas. Jun Chen from Forbes. Um, I have two questions. The first one is about uh, secessions. Uh, would a dictator, how would a dictator deal with the, se the secession issue? Succession. Today, did they have any locks in appointing their successors? And the second question is, um, would you say dictators are sick people? It is this a kind of disease that can be cured or prevented? <laughs> <laughs> I understand, is there a, a lesion on the frontal lobe? <laughs> or, or, or if it's not a biological feature, um, is there some psychological characteristic, you know, did Adolf Hitler get spanked by his papa when he was young? And that led him to commit all these crimes against humanity. Unfortunately, a lot of people get spanked when they're young, and there must be quite a few who walk around with a lesion on the frontal lobe. Trust me, I work in academia. So, but, but not all of them become dictators. So again, it goes back to what I said earlier on. It demands great skill, however reluctant you may be be to, uh, however reluctant it may be to, to acknowledge that. These are no clowns. Uh, sure, Charlie Chaplin, but these people were damn hard, and they have true gifts, uh, which failed them, ultimately, in many cases. Succession, it's all about loyalty. Who do you trust? Who can you trust? Hopefully, your own family members. Work well in Korea, three generations. Duvalier, Papa Doc, appointed baby doc, his own son. It prolonged the regime in the case of Haiti for about a dozen years till 1984. Ultimately, his mausoleum got ransacked uh, by ordinary people. Uh, in Korea, it still works. I'd say one of the most successful ones, without having planned a succession within his family, um, would be Mao. Unlike Stalin, uh, there has been no demaoification. His portrait is still up there. He managed to turn the party into accomplices of his own crimes, and hence turn them into custodians of his own image. Besides the fact that, of course, in the Soviet Union, they had two chaps, Lenin and Stalin. So you could keep Lenin as the founding father of the Soviet Union and still drag Stalin out of his mausoleum. You can't really do that in Beijing. Don't forget to identify yourself. Hi, I'm Tohan Shi. I'm a journalist from Singapore originally. Um, you earlier mentioned that dictators may appear very strong and stable and suddenly collapse. Can you elaborate and explain in greater detail how is it that a dictator could appear to be in a strong and stable position for a long time and suddenly just collapse? Well, because it's based on fear. And the moment there is a weakness that appears, that fear evaporates. There are those occasionally who talk about a spell uh, but I don't believe there is a spell. It's not magic. It's just fear. Uh, it takes sometimes decades to lead up to that moment. In the case of Ceausescu, uh, again, his luck, a lot, a lot of it has to do with luck. His luck was that the Soviet Union invaded Prague in 1968. He seized the moment, posed as one who was in favor of more humane socialism, was applauded by American presidents. 
Uh, yet over the decades, as he purged and purged again, and subjected his population to an awful regime impoverishing them, uh, bit by bit, uh, this population uh, became disaffected. And when he gives his speech before Christmas 89, uh, it takes him a while to realize that the people in the back who are normally paid to cheer him are actually booing him. His wife intervenes, taps the microphone. Elena Trushetsko, another, the only one great female dictator of the 20th century. Taps down, what is wrong with you? They don't understand what's happening. But Trushetsko's voice falters. He starts making promises. I will improve working conditions for workers. It's too late. It's too late. People realize he's the one who lives in fear. That's it. <laughs> On Christmas Day, they get shot against a toilet block. <laughs> Apparently, according to one of the executioners, Elena Trushetsko's last words are, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> we won't put that on the live stream. <laughs> If, and if you're in the veranda, I can't really see you put your hand up, but I will ask a question while we're waiting for the next question, if I don't see one, which is simply that uh, dictatorship to me, the ones I've covered, Marcos or, or, or Suharto or Zimbabwe, Mugabe, it also seem, it seems intertwined with massive amounts of corruption, not just mild corruption. I'm talking billions of dollars. Now, if I, if I stole my first billion dollars, I'd probably retire. Right? Why do these guys need billions of dollars? What's going on? Um, well, the, the corruption is intrinsic to the system. I, I pointed this out in, in Mao's Great Famine. Um, it, it, this is, of course, not, not your Mugabe dictatorship. This is a, a classic uh, command economy, but within a command common economy, without corruption, it wouldn't work. A true command economy enforced rigorously would collapse instantly. Uh, the, the corruption is the oil in the machine that makes it work. Now, who is corrupt in a one-party state, which is by definition a dictatorship? In a one-party state, every party member is corrupt. Uh, also by definition. Um, so when do you step down? Well, this goes back to the retirement plan. Uh, if you are a dictator, there is no retirement plan. Uh, there is no such thing as accumulating great wealth uh, and then somehow deciding that you're going to go back to your stamp collection or, or to fishing. It's because all along the way, you've accumulated so many enemies, you've purged so much, that it simply isn't possible. You must continue till the very bitter end. Not only that, but you don't even know who your enemies are. So one of the rules, I said there are no eight rules, there are just a tremendous number of rules, but a very good rule for any dictator is to make sure you get rid of your friends before you purge your enemies. <laughs> and, uh, there's no more questions anymore. I'm looking, oh, one, one last question over there at the back. I'm gonna be ruthless with time. Uh, Johan Nylander, journalist from Sweden. Uh, going back to China, um, so from, from a Western perspective, naturally the, the word dictator is, 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 is very negative. But for people in, in mainland China, they all lived under some sort of, under some sort of uh, dictator. Um, how is the word perceived there? Is it as negative as it is for Europeans? Or? Well, it's, it's in the constitution, the preamble to the constitution 1984, the People's Republic of China is a democratic dictatorship. How could you be a democratic dictatorship? All well, this goes back to what I said earlier on. Every dictatorship, must create the illusion of being a democracy. So this is where you get this bizarre idea that China is a democratic dictatorship. A dictatorship in a dictatorship is a good thing, not a bad thing. What, what is bad is all that wishy-washy separation of powers. When, certainly from the point of view of a, of a communist regime, all of that is really controlled by a small number of people who are capitalists. It's just a show. So dictatorship is a good thing. It's an enviable goal. Not one single leader in the People's Republic of China since 1949 has ever said anything positive about the separation of powers. No Mao, no Deng, no Chiang, no Hu, no whatever the last man with dyed hair says. 
they cherish dictatorship. They believe it works better. Well, seeing no other hands, and as I said, I'm going to have to be ruthless with our time, but uh, the holiday season is coming up, and if you're looking for a stocking stuffer, <laughs> and you know someone who may be interested in taking over a small country, or even a large one, I think uh, Frank is dictating to a few young folks over there at the front, and I think he even is willing to stay behind and sign this book. Right? Yes, Frank will be staying behind and signing this book, how to be a dictator. So please, uh, thank you to Frank Decoder, and uh, welcome back to the FCC. Thank you very much.